Chapter 1 Seers, or men of the second sight, have very terrifying encounters with the fairies they call Sliama, or the good people. The Secret Commonwealth, by Robert Kirk and Andrew Lang, 1893. Four ball side pocket. Ashling pushed the cue forward with a short, quick thrust. The ball dropped into the pocket with a satisfying clack. Her playing partner, Denny, motioned toward a harder shot, a bank shot. She rolled her eyes. What? You in a hurry? He pointed with the cue. Right. Focus and control. That's what it's all about. She sank the two. He nodded once, as close as he got to praise. Ashling circled the table, paused, and chalked the cue. Around her, the cracks of balls colliding, low laughter. Even the endless stream of country and blues from the jukebox kept her grounded in the real world. The human world. The safe world. It wasn't the only world, no matter how much Ashling wanted it to be. But it hid the other world, the ugly one, for brief moments. Three, corner pocket. She sighted down the queue. It was a good shot. Focus, control. Then she felt it, warm air on her skin. A fairy, its too hot breath on her neck, sniffed her hair. His pointed chin pressed against her skin. All the focus in the world didn't make pointy faces' attention tolerable. She scratched. The only ball that dropped was the cue ball. Denny took the ball in hand. What was that? Weak assed? She forced a smile, looking at Denny, at the table, anywhere but at the horde coming in the door. Even when she looked away, she heard them, laughing and squealing, gnashing teeth and beating wings, a cacophony she couldn't escape. They were out in droves now, freer somehow as evening fell, invading her space, ending any chance of the peace she'd sought. Denny didn't stare at her, didn't ask hard questions. He just motioned for her to step away from the table and called out, Gracie, Play something for Ash. At the jukebox, Grace keyed in one of the few not country or blues songs, Limp Biscuits, Break Stuff. As the oddly comforting lyrics in that gravelly voice took off, building to the inevitable stomach-tightening rage, Ashling smiled. If I could let go like that, let the years of aggression spill out onto the fay. She slid her hand over the smooth wood of the queue, watching Pointy Face gyrate beside Grace. I'd start with him. Right here, right now. She bit her lip. Of course, everyone would think she was utterly mad if she started swinging her cue at invisible bodies. Everyone but the Fay. Before the song was over, Denny had cleared the table. Nice. Ashling walked over to the wall rack and slid the cue back into an empty spot. Behind her, Pointy Face giggled, high and shrill, and tore out a couple strands of her hair. Rack em again? But Denny's tone said what he didn't, that he knew the answer before he asked. He didn't know why, but he could read the signs. Pointy Face slid the strands of her hair over his face. Ashling cleared her throat. Rain check? Sure. Denny began disassembling his cue. The regulars never commented on her odd mood swings or unexplainable habits. She walked away from the table, murmuring goodbyes as she went, consciously not staring at the fairies. They moved balls out of line, bumped into people, anything to cause trouble. But they hadn't stepped in her path tonight. Not yet. At the table nearest the door, she paused. 
I'm out of here. One of the guys straightened up from a pretty combination shot. He rubbed his goatee, stroking the gray shot hair. Cinderella time? You know how it is. Gotta get home before the shoe falls off. She lifted her foot, clad in a battered tennis shoe. No sense tempting any princes. He snorted and turned back to the table. A doe-eyed fairy eased across the room, bone thin with too many joints. She was vulgar and gorgeous all at once. Her eyes were far too large for her face, giving her a startled look. Combined with an emaciated body, those eyes made her seem vulnerable, innocent. She wasn't. None of them are. The woman at the table beside Ashling flicked a long ash into an already overflowing ashtray. See you next weekend? Ashling nodded, too tense to answer. In a blurringly quick move, doe eyes flicked a thin blue tongue out at a cloven hoofed fairy. The fairy stepped back, but a trail of blood already dripped down his hollowed cheeks. Doe eyes giggled. Ashling bit her lip, hard, and lifted a hand in a last half wave to Denny. Focus. She fought to keep her steps even, calm, everything she wasn't feeling inside. She stepped outside, lips firmly shut against dangerous words. She wanted to speak, to tell the Fae to leave so she didn't have to. But she couldn't, ever. If she did, they'd know her secret. They'd know she could see them. The only way to survive was to keep that secret. Grams taught her that rule before she could even write her name. Keep your head down and your mouth closed. It felt wrong to have to hide, but if she even hinted at such a rebellious idea, Grams would have her in lockdown, homeschooled, no pool halls, no parties, no freedom, no Seth. She'd spent enough time in that situation during middle school. Never again. So, rage in check, Ashling headed downtown toward the relative safety of iron bars and steel doors. Whether in its base form or altered into the purer form of steel, iron was poisonous to Fay, and thus gloriously comforting to her. Despite the fairies that walked her streets, Huntsdale was home. She'd visited Pittsburgh, walked around D.C., explored Atlanta. They were nice enough, but they were too thriving, too alive, too filled with parks and trees. Huntsdale wasn't thriving. It hadn't been for years. That meant the Fae didn't thrive here either. Revelry rang from most of the alcoves and alleys she passed, but it wasn't ever as bad as the thronging choke of fairies that cavorted on the mall in D.C. or at the botanical gardens in Pittsburgh. She tried to comfort herself with that thought as she walked. There were less Fae here. Less people, too. Less is good. The streets weren't empty. People went about their business, shopping, walking, laughing. It was easier for them. They didn't see the blue fairy who had cornered several winged fay behind a dirty window. They never saw the fairies with lion's manes, racing across power lines, tumbling over one another, landing on a towering woman with angled teeth. To be so blind... It was a wish Ashling had held in secret her whole life. But wishing didn't change what was. And even if she could somehow stop seeing the Fae, a person can't unknow the truth. She tucked her hands in her pockets and kept walking, past the mother with her obviously exhausted children, past shop windows with frost creeping over them, past the frozen gray sludge all along the street. She shivered. The seemingly endless winter had already begun.
She'd passed the corner of Harper and Third, almost there, when they stepped out of an alley. The same two fairies who'd followed her almost every day the past two weeks. The girl had long white hair, streaming out like spirals of smoke. Her lips were blue, not lipstick blue, but corpse blue. She wore a faded brown leather skirt stitched with thick cords. Beside her was a huge white wolf that she'd alternately lean on or ride. When the other fairy touched her, steam rose from her skin. She bared her teeth at him, shoved him, slapped him. He did nothing but smile. And he was devastating when he did. He glowed faintly all the time, as if hot coals burned inside him. His collar-length hair shimmered like strands of copper that would slice her skin if Ashling were to slide her fingers through it. Not that she would. Even if he were truly human, he wouldn't be her type. Tan and too beautiful to touch, walking with a swagger that said he knew exactly how attractive he was. He moved as if he were in charge of everyone and everything, seeming taller for it. But he wasn't really that tall. Not as tall as the bone girls by the river, or the strange tree bark men that roamed the city. He was almost average in size, only a head taller than she was. Whenever he came near, she could smell wildflowers, could hear the rustle of willow branches, as if she were sitting by a pond on one of those rare summer days, the taste of midsummer in the start of the frigid fall. And she wanted to keep that taste, bask in it, roll in it until the warmth soaked into her very skin. It terrified her, the almost irresistible urge to get closer to him, to get closer to any of the fae. He terrified her. 